Hi, today's topic is on acute kidney injury. Kidney failure is a partial or complete impairment of kidney function. It results in an inability to excrete metabolic waste products and water and it contributes to disturbances of all body systems. Kidney failure may be acute or chronic. Acute kidney injury is characterized by a rapid or sudden loss of kidney function. This loss is accompanied by a rise in the serum creatinine level and a reduction in urine output. The severity of dysfunction can range from a small increase in serum creatinine or reduction in urine output to the development of azotemia, which is an, in an accumulation of nitrogenous waste products like urea, nitrogen, and creatinine in the blood. Acute kidney injury can develop over hours or days with progressive elevations of blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, and potassium with or without a reduction in urine output. Acute kidney injury is potentially reversible. The etiology and pathophysiology of acute kidney injury. There are three different causes, which is pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal. The pre-renal causes of AKI are factors external to the kidneys. These factors reduces systemic circulation, causes a reduction in the renal blood flow. The most common problems leading to AKI are hypovolemic shock and heart failure, example severe dehydration, heart failure, and decreased cardiac output. In pre-renal oliguria, there is no damage to the kidney tissue or the parenchyma of the kidney kidneys. Therefore, early AKI often can be reversed by correcting the blood volume, increasing the blood pressure, and improving the cardiac output. With a decrease in circulating blood volume, the kidney compensates by constricting the renal blood vessels and activating the autoregulatory mechanisms, namely the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism, and releasing the antidiuretic hormone, which results in increasing the blood volume and improving kidney perfusion to preserve blood flow to essential organs. Pre-renal azotemia results in a reduction in the excretion of sodium, increased salt and water retention, and decreased urine output. AKI, AKI pre-renal conditions can lead to intrarenal disease if renal ischemia is prolonged. If decreased perfusion persists for an extended period of time, the kidneys lose their ability to compensate and damage the damage to kidney parenchyma occurs, leading to intrarenal damage. The intrarenal causes for AKI. Intrarenal causes of AKI include conditions that cause direct damage to the kidney tissue, resulting in impaired nephron function. The damage from intrarenal causes usually results from prolonged ischemia, nephrotoxins like aminoglycosides, antibiotics, contrast media, hemoglobin released from hemolyzed red blood cells, or myoglobin released from necrotic muscle cells. Nephrotoxins can cause obstruction of intrarenal structures by crystallization or by causing damage to the epithelial cells of the tubules. Hemoglobin and myoglobin can block the tubules and cause renal vasoconstriction. Diseases of the kidneys such as glomerulonephritis, systemic lupus erythematosus may also cause AKI. Intrarenal causes. Acute tubular necrosis or ATN is the most common cause of intrarenal AKI and is primarily the result of ischemia, nephrotoxins, or sepsis. Severe kidney ischemia causes a disruption in the basement membrane and patchy destruction of the tubular epithelium. Nephrotoxic agents cause necrosis of tubular epithelial cells which slough off and plug the tubules. 
ATN is potentially reversible if the basement membrane is not destroyed and the tubular epithelium regenerates. Postrenal causes. The postrenal causes of AKI involves mechanical obstruction in the flow of urine. As the flow of urine is obstructed, urine refluxes into the renal pelvis, impairing kidney function. The most common causes are benign prostatic hyperplasia, prostate cancer, calculi, trauma, and extra renal tumors. Bilateral urethral obstruction leads to hydronephrosis or kidney dilation, increase in hydrostatic pressure and tubular blockage that results in a progressive decline in kidney function. If bilateral obstruction is relieved within 48 hours of onset, complete recovery is likely. If it is not relieved after 12 weeks, recovery is unlikely. Prolonged obstruction can lead to tubular atrophy and irreversible kidney fibrosis. Clinically, AKI may progress through three phases, oliguric, diuretic, and recovery phase. When a patient does not recover from AKI, then chronic kidney disease may develop. The rifle classification is used to de describe the stages of AKI. Rifle standardizes the diagnosis of acute kidney injury. Risk or R is the first stage of AKI where the GFR is decreased by 25% followed by injury, which is represented by the letter I, which is the second stage where the GFR is decreased by 50% and then increases in severity to the final or third stage of failure, which is F, where the GFR is decreased by 75%. The two outcome variables are loss, or represented by L, and end-stage kidney disease, represented by E. In the last two stages, there is complete failure of the kidneys. Clinical manifestations in the oliguric phase. Oliguria is a reduction in urine output to less than 400 ml per day. Oliguria usually occurs within one to seven days of the injury to the kidneys. If the cause is ischemia, oliguria will often occur within 24 hours. With nephrotoxic drugs, onset may be delayed by as long as one week. The duration of the oliguric phase lasts on average about 10 to 14 days, but can last months in some cases. The longer the oliguric phase lasts, the poorer the prognosis for complete recovery of kidney function. A, a urinalysis may show CAS, RBCs, and white blood cells. The CAS are formed from mucoprotein impressions of the necro necrotic renal tubular epithelial cells, which detach or slough into the tubules. The urine specific gravity is fixed at around 1.010 and osmolality at about 300 milliosmolality per kilograms. This reflects the loss of concentrating ability by the kidneys. With glomerular membrane dysfunction, proteinuria may be present. Other clinical manifestations related to fluid volume in the oliguric phase. Hypovolemia has the potential to exacerbate all forms of AKI. The reversal of hypovolemia with fluid replacement is often sufficient to treat many forms of AKI, especially those with pre-renal causes, namely dehydration. When urine output decreases, fluid retention occurs. The severity of the symptoms depends on the extent of the fluid overload. In the case of reduced urine output, namely anuria and oliguria, the neck veins may become distended with a bounding pulse. Edema and hypertension may develop. Fluid overload can eventually lead to heart failure, pulmonary edema, pericardial and pleural effusions. In kidney failure, the kidneys cannot synthesize ammonia which is needed for hydrogen ion excretion nor excrete the acid products of metabolism. 
So bicarbonates are used up to buffer the hydrogen ions and so the serum bicarbonate level decreases. In addition, defective reabsorption and regeneration of bicarbonate occurs. With development of severe acidosis, the patient may develop cosmos respirations, which is rapid and deep respirations, in an effort to compensate for the acidosis by increasing the exhalation of carbon dioxide. Sodium balance. Damaged tubules cannot conserve sodium. Consequently, the urinary excretion of sodium may increase, resulting in normal or below normal levels of serum sodium. Uncontrolled hyponatremia or water excess can lead to cerebral edema. Next, potassium excess. The kidneys normally excrete 80 to 90 percent of the body's potassium. In AKI, the serum potassium level increases because the kidney's normal ability to excrete potassium is impaired. Massive tissue trauma and damaged cells release addi additional potassium into the extracellular fluid. Acidosis also worsens hyperkalemia because with acidosis, the excess hydrogen ions enter the cells and the potassium is driven out of the cells into the into the extracellular fluid. Hyperkalemia causes changes in the ECG, namely peaked T waves, widening of the QRS complex, and ST segment depression. Next, hematological problems in acute kidney injury. Hospital acquired AKI often occurs in patients who have multi organ failure. Lyco leukocytosis is often present with AKI. The most common cause of death in AKI is infection. The most common sites of infection are the urinary and the respiratory systems. Waste product accumulation is another clinical manifestation. The kidneys are the primary excretory organs for urea which is an end product of protein metabolism and creatinine, an end product of the endogenous muscle metabolism. Bun and creatinine levels are elevated in, the kid in kidney failure. Neurological issues. Neurological changes can also occur as the nitrogenous waste products accumulate in the brain and other nervous tissue. The manifestations can be as mild as fatigue and difficulty concentrating and then escalate to seizures, stupor and coma. Next is clinical manifestations in the diuretic phase. During the diuretic phase of AKI, daily urine output usually is approximately 1 to 3 liters but may reach 5 liters or more. The high urine volume is caused by osmotic diuresis from the high urea concentration in the glomerular filtrate and the inability of the tubules to concentrate the urine. The kidneys have recovered their ability to excrete waste but not to concentrate the urine. Because of the large losses of fluid and electrolytes, the patient must be monitored for hyponatremia, hypokalemia and dehydration. The diuretic phase may last one to three weeks. Near the end of this phase, the patient's acid base, electrolyte and waste products, which is bun and creatinine values, begin to normalize. The third and the last phase is the recovery phase. The recovery phase begins when the GFR increases, allowing the BUN and serum creatinine levels to plateau and then slowly decrease. Although the major improvements occur in the first one, first two weeks of this phase, kidney function may take up to 12 months to stabilize.